Um, okay, so um, hi, I'm Chrissy Collins, and I'm at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm actually based in the ecology department now, um, but my background is in archaeology, but I haven't uh, presented in front of archaeologists for several years now, so it's interesting to be back at an archaeology conference and not surrounded by ecologists and people who study badges and such like. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some observations that I've made um, over the course of my interactions with archaeology um, in terms of uh, research bias. And um, so I did my PhD uh, looking at the Upper Paleolithic of southwest France, and it's obviously a region and a period which has been accused of being kind of overstudied quite a lot. And during my PhD, I became very used to defending myself from the fact that I was studying this region. However, when I did come to look at my results, I did notice some interesting trends which I think could only be explain, explained by research bias. And um, so I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. And I'm also going to be using the results from my PhD to maybe suggest a way of developing a metric to um, assess research bias in, um, in prehistory. So I think that we, you know, we can actually observe research bias, we can potentially measure the effect of research bias and the direction of research bias and potentially correct for it. Um, so uh, currently I work for the University of Exeter in the ecology department and I'm working on a project which is looking at the last 10,000 years in 30 different regions of the world. So it's an absolutely um, enormous project and we're using uh, the Seshat data bank which is this enormous open ac um, well, soon to be open access database co um, covering the last 10,000 years in 30 regions of the world. And I've been using the data contained in the Seshat data bank to um, try to uh, model carrying capacity for these 30 regions of the world over the last 10,000 years. And during the course of creating these carrying capacity trends, I've really come to notice that when it comes to comparing different regions, um, with the, you know, the archaeological record is really patchy for some and really complete for others, and it can be a real problem in doing comparative archaeology. So I think we need to be aware of the effect of um, research bias, and especially when it comes to doing comparative archaeology. And um, so anyway, I don't mean this to be come across as a criticism um, of people working on the regions and periods I'm going to mention. I think it's, you know, obviously we all, we all want to study the interesting periods, the interesting regions, and we're drawn to things, you know, where there's, in, where there's a good archaeological record. And I think this is just human nature, really. Um, but also, so I'm going to be talking about this idea of the snowball effect, um, I think that in the past there have been, um, and, and even today, there are particularly maybe charismatic individuals um, who have really great research outputs and you know, are, you know, produce so much output, and that's fantastic. But, um, you know, and research students tend to be drawn to these researchers, and that you know, makes perfect sense. Um, but it can lead to this snowballing whereby charismatic individuals, individuals with large outputs, um, then attract more research students, attract more funding, and the whole thing just snowballs. So we end up with um, very complete archaeological records for some regions and very patchy ones for others. And as I say, that's fine, but when we're comparing you know, two different regions, two different peri periods, we have to remember that we're not, we don't have the same amount of data for each. So um, just to reiterate, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to attack anybody who works on these regions or periods. You know, my PhD was on the Upper Paleolithic of Southwest France, and um, then I've, I've done quite a lot of work on the Neolithic of Central Anatolia. So, if there is a problem, I'm as guilty as anyone else. But I think we should try and be aware of um, these research biases. So, just to show you the two main regions that I'm going to be talking about today: um, the Southwest France region, where I did my um, PhD research centered on. Um, so the, the region around the Dordogne and surrounding departments, um, obviously there's a really intense history of research in this region, um, beginning you know, in the Victorian era and then kind of uh, accelerating from there and there's still a lot of research done in this, in this region. And then um, the Konya region of Turkey, um, as you can see in the map, um, so I've taken the wider definition of Konya which we're using for our current uh, Seshat research project, uh, the broader uh, Konya region. So anyway, that's where I'm talking about. Right, so sorry to uh, jump in with the graphs. There are going to be quite a lot of graphs, <coughs> considering this is a historical session. Um, so my PhD was uh, using demographic um, archaeological methods to look at population trends in the prehistory of uh, southwest France. Um, most um, archaeological de demographic methods uh, work on the principle that more stuff equals more people. And obviously this, this approach is being criticised by some, but um, this is the general approach that we use in demographic methods in archaeology. 
Um, so I was mainly using the dates as data method in my PhD, where the frequency of radiocarbon dates are used as a proxy for activity in the past, and where um, the uh, some probability distributions uh, produced from calibrated radiocarbon dates are used as a proxy for populations. So essentially, you take the radiocarbon dates from a region, uh, you calibrate them, and where possible, you build Bayesian models. And that's really important. I'm going to be talking about that quite a lot in terms of research bias, because it's quite technical, but it, I think it really can give us a window into research bias. So we take uh, radiocarbon dates from the region, or we calibrate them, and we model them where possible. We sum them within sites, which is to partly control for research bias, but it doesn't really completely control for research bias. So the idea is that by summing within uh, individual sites it, and then summing across the region, it means that each individual site should only count once towards creating the sum probability distribution for the region. So anyway, then we sum across the region and peaks and troughs in the distribution are interpreted as representing peaks and troughs in population processes in the past. And so you can see here, this is from Talavara et al., and they uh, reconstructed population history for prehistoric Fenoscandia uh, using that method. And peaks mean more people and troughs mean less people. Simple, right? Well, research bias, I think, can kind of uh, jumble up our interpretation of population processes in prehistory. So um, this is kind of a key result from my PhD, really. This is when I used the dates as data method as described just then to reconstruct population trends in southwest France across the Upper Paleolithic. Peaks being more people, troughs being less people. And I've included all modelled and unmodelled dates in this distribution. Um, yes, again, sorry for all the graphs, but that's why I produce graphs. Um, so anyway, uh, as I mentioned that where possible, we build Bayesian models for radiocarbon dates. Um, so the idea is that with a radiocarbon date from a well-dated well site with good stratigraphic information, you're able to build uh, stratigraphic models whereby you incorporate information about the position of the sample in the stratigraphy, um, and you incorporate that, and you're able to kind of increase the reliability of the calibrated radiocarbon date using this additional stratigraphic information. But you can only model radiocarbon dates where we have good stratigraphic information and where multiple radiocarbon dates have been produced, ideally in sequence. So by definition, you can only model radiocarbon dates from well-researched sites. And I think this means that we might potentially be able to get a window into the extent and direction of research bias by uh, comparing modelled and unmodelled dates for regions. And you know, I'm thinking maybe we might potentially be able to get a metric and assess the extent of uh, research bias. And you know, it might, you know, if, if you have a good radiocarbon database for a region, then you could perhaps quite readily use this suggested method. So um, for southwest France, I've um, divided the dates into modelled and unmodelled. Um, so modelled being dates that come from well-researched sites with good uh, research histories and multiple radiocarbon dates available, and then unmodelled dates, um, unmodelled uh, dates which tend to come from sites which don't have this same research history, don't have the same resources, and haven't had as many radiocarbon dates produced. And um, I noticed a couple of things. Um, I noticed that, in general, the um, unmodelled dates tended to have peaks which were slightly later than for the modelled dates, so much more recent. And I wondered if this might be um, the result of perhaps uh, different research agendas um, in terms of the sites which have had multiple radiocarbon dates produced, which have had uh, plenty, of, um, plenty of excavations and research intensity at, and I wondered if it might be different research agendas. Perhaps the, um, you know, perhaps certain researchers are more interested in dating the earliest things, or are more interested in this region in dating earlier sites. So, um, in the unmodelled distribution, there's um, a few peaks in the Ignatian which are missing, um, um, which are which are which do occur in the modelled date distribution, but don't occur in the others. And like um, and likewise, it seems as almost as if if you compare the two distributions, there's almost a lag whereby the unmodelled dates um, have peaks which are slightly later than for the modelled dates. And I wondered if this kind of could give a, potentially give us a metric into the extent of research bias in the region. And perhaps this might be um, even starker, is when you consider the fact that 48.6% of radiocarbon dates in my um, database come from just eight sites. 
And I think this really tells you about the extent of kind of re inter-region research bias. And if you look at the, dis the, the sums probability distribution from the dates from just these eight sites, it, if you were inter using this distribution to interpret um, population trends in the region, um, you would have a completely different picture than when you incorporate the dates from the other sites, the sites which have far fewer radiocarbon dates. Uh, it's quite telling, really. If you're using this to interpret population history, you would think that there were no people there in the Magdalenian at all and that everyone left after the Salutrian, whereas, of course, we can see that actually uh, quite something quite different happens and there's quite a lot of people there in the Magdalenian. So I think that's um, indicative of the extent of research bias. Um, so anyway, I think potentially there's a slight bias towards dating older things in southwest France, and um, I think this might be the result of uh, the research agendas, snowballing of research agendas from the early days <coughs> of research in the region. I think that, um, I don't think anyone's to blame for this, I just think, as I say, key individuals take on students in the area who become professionals and take on their own students, find their own funding, and it just snowballs um, to the detriment of other periods. So anyway... Um, as I said, I'm working on a project now which is looking at 30 different regions of the world, and I'm going to kind of talk now about the um, Central Anatolia region. Um, so I'm trying to um, so I'm trying to reconstruct uh, carrying capacity for 30 different regions of the world, which is quite a mammoth task. Uh, here are just nine of them so far, and I've really noticed that for some regions we're really lacking the data on um, agricultural technologies, which I need to um, reconstruct carrying capacity. So, um, for example, for the Deccan region, I think there's been quite a lot of research intensity in the region, but due to other taphonomic, taphonomic factors, we don't have uh, palynological data to um, uh, interpret archaeological agricultural techniques in the past. Um, and when it comes to Konya, I was really struck by um, how much we know about the Neolithic of Konya and how little we know about later periods in Konya. And this makes sense, really, um, when you think about the history of research in the Konya region. So in trying to, inter um, in trying to reconstruct carrying capacity for Konya and for every region, I've had, to, I've had to try and look at when agriculture first appears in the region and what techniques people are using in the region um, for growing crops. And the first basic question I have to ask myself is, once agriculture appears in this region, do they continue practising agriculture uh, up until the modern era, which is a fundamental question, really. And it's quite incredible that for Konya, which is such a well-researched region in terms of the Neolithic, I couldn't actually answer this question uh, based on the archaeological data alone. So when I spoke to some ex experts to ask, um, on the Konya region to ask them, do you think that agriculture is practised uh, continuously from the Neolithic up until um, the modern day, including the Bronze Age, quite a few people said to me, well, of course it is, because there are so many Bronze Age sites that they must have had agriculture to support that population. Well, we're trying to avoid such circular reasoning in our um, carrying capacities, which we're reconstructing now. So um, it's just kind of... I was just a bit stunned, really, that we couldn't answer this question, like, are they practising agriculture in the Bronze Age? And I think, to some extent, that comes down to the major sites that we're using to um, understand agriculture in the Konya region, so, um, obviously, Shafelhuyuk is the main data source for Neolithic Konya, um, while Ajimhuyuk is the main <coughs> data source for the Bronze Age in Konya. And um, at Shafelhuyuk, obviously, there's a great history of research at Shafelhuyuk, from uh, Mellart's excavations to Hodder's excavations. And um, so, uh, looking at the history of agriculture for the, uh, for the Konya region, we have a really fantastic idea about how they were farming, what they were farming, whether they were using crop rotation, all sorts of agricultural techniques which we need to know about in order to model carrying capacity. But when it comes to uh, the Bronze Age, we're mainly basing it on Ajimhyuk, um, which is uh, described as a pastoral site, and um, Arbuckle's work at Ajimhyuk, um, he describes it as a pastoral site in a pastoral region, and he doesn't think that agriculture was practised in Konya at all. Well, my question really is, is it a pastoral site in a pastoral region or is it a zooarchaeological site that's just been studied by zooarchaeologists? And I can't really separate that out at the moment. So I think until more palynologists and other archaeological specialists have researched the Bronze Age in Konya, um, we can't really answer this question, were they practising agriculture? Um, so I think, in general, we need to be aware of research bias in prehistoric archaeology, particularly when trying to compare different regions and periods. 
And um, I think we might be able to provide a window into the extent of research bias on the basis of modelled versus unmodelled dates in um, the record. And I'm going to try and develop this into a proper metric approach. Um, I haven't really done it yet. But I think there is potential for creating a metric, uh, metric to assess research bias. And I think some key archaeological interpretations are currently clouded by research bias. And it's kind of shocking, really, that we don't know if they're practising agriculture in Konya after the Neolithic, um, considering we know so much about the Neolithic. So, um, anyway, I didn't mean to criticise anyone working on those regions or periods, but um, it would be cool if we could fill in the gaps. Thanks. <laughs>